I'm going to go ahead and start us off this evening. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us this Friday night forum at Beller Church, where we will be engaging in Christian conversations about challenging issues. I'm Mike Morgan. For those of you that don't know me, and I'm going to be the host tonight. We're, we're going to be having a conversation about how to have a civil conversation while choosing kingdom connection over political partisanship. We'll be drawing deeply from our first forum with Jared Bias, where he helped lay uh, some significant groundwork from which we build this conversation. So if you haven't had a chance to go and listen to that forum, I'd encourage you to do so. You can go to belair.org forward slash Friday Night Forum, or you can go and visit our Bel Air Church YouTube channel and you can watch that first forum there. Now, tonight's forum, I really wanna be clear, tonight's forum is not a debate. Uh, if you're looking for a debate, you can find many online. You just Google a debate about you know, what's going on in politics right now. You can go to YouTube um, and find debates there as well. In fact, I've watched one just this week, uh, but tonight is not a debate. Uh, tonight is not a ploy to influence your vote. Uh, everyone I think involved in this forum that will be on the panel has already voted. Uh, I know I have voted, you got my sticker right here. Um, by this time in the election season, if you haven't already voted, I'm pretty confident that you've already made up your mind. So we're not trying to convince anybody of a certain political uh, perspective. We're not trying to influence your vote. What this night is all about is kingdom connection through Christian conversation. We are all Christian, intelligent people who love God and want to follow Jesus with every aspect of our lives. And we've all cast our votes, and individually, I bet we would all agree that we each individually are right. <laughs> like, our vote was the right vote. Great, so now we don't need to try to convince one another of what is right. Rather, we're trying to listen to one another to seek to understand why we value the things that we value and to better understand our fears and our concerns. We are all about connection over convincing, curiosity over judgment. And we're gonna be talking a lot about how do we as Christians continue in civil engagement post-election? How far do we go with Christian civility when it comes to core convictions? What does it look like for us to model Christ-like compassion in contemporary society? And there might be other questions that arise as we, as we go about this discussion this evening. Now, I want to get into some housekeeping before we get started. Uh, we are recording this forum. Uh, it is recorded and it will be made available on our website. Uh, you'll notice that we've disabled everyone's audio. Uh, that's on purpose. There will be some later in the evening that will be on the panel that will also uh, be uh, engaging in this conversation. Uh, but this forum is being recorded. Uh, we, will, um, we have panelists tonight. We've invited these panelists who represent themselves, and the panelists have different political viewpoints. They'll be modeling for us how to engage in kingdom connection. We will be fielding questions later in the forum. You can direct all your questions through our chat by selecting the got questions, uh, and you can send your questions there. I can't promise, though, that we're going to be able to get to everyone's questions. Our panelists are going to have questions, but we're going to do the best we can uh, trying to field as many questions as possible. So with that, let me uh, pray before I introduce our special guest this evening. Lord God, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Almighty God, Creator, Sustainer, we come to you tonight. We are so grateful for who you are, that you are faithful, that you are steadfast, that you are trustworthy. We love you. We long to serve you. We want to know you. We want to be known by you, and we ask that you would... Um, <laughs> enter into this conversation. We trust that you're already among us, even on Zoom, that you are in our midst, that your Holy Spirit is among us, and we thank you for that. Would you guide us tonight? Would you be with Dr. Mao as he shares, and would you be with our panelists as they are courageous in their conversation, Lord? And ultimately, through this conversation, would you receive glory? We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, we have asked Dr. Mao to speak to us because he has built his career on bridge building. He is a very respected and, and honored uh, member in, in our Christian community, and Dr. Mao has spent most of his 
career pointing towards the space between us. Us being maybe um, how you might define one another on the other side, the space between us, like Jews and Muslims or Christians and Mormons or Democrats and Republicans. He's always looking for the commonalities between us. Rich is a bridge builder. He is, he has been, and he's, he's based his career on this kind of work. And it's because of this that we've asked Dr. Mao to join us this evening. Dr. Richard Mao is a professor of faith and public life at Fuller Theological Seminary, where he served for 20 years as the school's president. Dr. Mao earned a master's degree in philosophy at the University of Alberta and a PhD at the University of Chicago. And before joining the Fuller faculty in 1985, Dr. Mao taught philosophy at Calvin College for 17 years. He is the author of uh, over 20 books, two very pertinent to the, tonight's conversation, um, which are Uncommon Decency, Christian Civility in an Uncivilized World, and Adventures in Evangelical Civility, a Lifelong Quest for Common Ground, as well as his, uh, his most recent pub publication titled All That God Cares About. Dr. Mao, it is an honor and a privilege to have you here this evening. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Mike, and uh, greetings to all of you. It's a delight to be back with uh, Bel Air folks. Phyllis and I uh, have a, a very warm spot in our hearts for uh, Bel Air Church, and uh, I'm just honored and personally uh, just pleased to be able to share some thoughts with you about this, uh, this very difficult situation that we find ourselves in. I think those of us who've been around for a while will, will confirm that uh, it's probably never been quite as divided, uh, as polarized uh, in our nation, and even within the Christian community on the issues that are raised in this election. And I'm, I, I was very interested and pleased that Mike, when he, uh, when, when he talked about uh, what we're going to focus on, he said, uh, how can we engage in civil conversations after the election? And I want to emphasize the fact that uh, I, I think it has to start after the election. Uh, I've been doing a number of Zoom uh, events with pastors in the last uh, two months. And uh, uh, many of them are just uh, deeply distressed about how do we deal with these issues in the local congregation? Uh, there's not a congregation that I know of that isn't divided over the issues being raised in the campaign. And that's not just true of, say, our Presbyterian churches or broader evangelical churches, <clears throat> Pentecostal churches, but it's true of Catholic churches, it's true of Lutheran, United Church of Christ, even the more liberal denominations, it may not be 8119. Like it, like uh, the the voting in the last election uh, in the evangelical world, but it's 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 usually um, at least uh, seventy thirty or seventy five twenty five or or in Catholicism it's almost fifty fifty in many local uh, Catholic congregations. There's just a lot of anger, polarization, expresses of expressions of mean spirited accusations mm. and uh, pastors have said to me how do i deal with this uh, do i say something from the pulpit about about this and my answer is not until the election is over because uh we have very discerning congregations sometimes a, a little too discerning because if they hear a pastor say a certain kind of phrase uh they will just assume that it's a political sermon and that he's saying you should vote for Trump or, or vote for Biden. And uh, I've had pastors tell me that uh, uh, when they get together with other pastors, they agree that uh, words like immigration uh, just probably should not be mentioned in the pulpit. Uh, certainly words like sexuality right now. And uh, issues, I mean, just there's just a lot of polarization. And so I'm saying, uh, I think the hard work for us has to begin at, after January 21. Uh, frankly, I think the Congress 
Senate and the House of Representatives, wh whoever wins, will continue to yell at each other. There will continue to be confrontation because one of the, the big problems we've run into as a nation politically in recent years is that uh, in, the, in the old days, uh, once a new uh, election was over, a national election, uh, people would turn to the task of governing. Uh, these days, the, the, the next campaign begins uh, right away. And we've seen that in the rhetoric of both parties, uh, just uh, even before this election campaign. Uh, so what do we say at the end of January? And, and I think uh, part of it, and I think we're all longing for this because we, we want to talk to each other uh, about these things, but we don't know how. Uh, we're it's a little nervous. Uh, we get a little nervous about raising the issues and we need uh, safe places. You know, uh, Mike mentioned that one of the things I've been very involved in for 20 years is uh, evangelical Mormon dialogue. And this started off for me when I was contacted by a leading theologian at Brigham Young University, probably the best known of the uh, Mormon theologians, a guy named Robert Millett, Bob Millett, who's become one of my dear friends. And uh, he wondered whether Fuller and Brigham Young could co-sponsor an evangelical Mormon dialogue. And I said, you know, I'm president of Fuller we could lose a lot of money over this. I better at the very least clear it with my board. And uh, we decided to invite Bob Millett to a board meeting, a meeting of the trustees of Fuller Seminary. And uh, he made a wonderful plea uh, behind closed doors. It was off the record, but uh, he gives me permission now to uh, quote him and what he said 20 years ago. He said, you know, we Mormons, uh, haven't really been in conversation with traditional Christians for a, a, a century and a half, 150 years. He said, we've yelled at each other, we've called each other names, we've gossiped about each other, we've accused each other of things, but we really haven't talked. And if we do start explaining our theology, we're not, we Mormons aren't even sure that we're using the right terminology. When we say we don't believe in the Trinity, but we believe in the three persons of the Godhead. Uh, is that a confusing way to put it? Uh, could we say that there are certain versions of the doctrine of the Trinity that we could agree with? We just don't know, he said. And what we need, and, and this is what convinced the board unanimously to endorse the idea of a dialogue. Uh, we need a safe place where we can just try stuff out and, uh, and hear each other, listen to to each other uh, without having to win. You know? And that's what we need is the safe places. Uh, and it's hard to, to feel safe in talking about issues when you've already voted or when the election is coming up. Uh, we find that in church meetings too. You know, we get into these big debates about sexuality and other things and pretty soon we got to vote. And so we line up in terms of how we're going to vote. We don't really often listen to each other. And so we need safe places. And I think the church can provide that. I think the church ought to provide that. A friend of mine who's uh, gone on to glory, but uh, for many years, a uh, professor of theology at Harvard Divinity School, Ronald Thiemann, and we can do the slide on this. Uh, Ron Thiemann uh, made this, this wonderful proposal that local congregations, he said, should function, function as uh, schools of public virtue. Can we get the slide? Yeah. Uh, schools of public virtue as communities that seek to form the kind of character necessary for public life. Yeah. That's it. Uh, but when we talk about civility, we talk about toleration, we talk about really listening to each other, these are issues of character. And I'm convinced that uh, uh, you know, when, I, when I began working on civility, I was very taken with a wonderful line from Dr. Martin Marty of the University of Chicago, who, who said in his one of the books, almost a throwaway line, but he said, a lot of people these days who are civil don't have very strong convictions. And a lot of people who have strong convictions aren't very civil. And what we really need is convicted civility. And you know, I find that in the Bible. 
Uh, 1 Peter 3.15 is a verse that I was raised on as an evangelical kid, uh, 15 years old. We, we heard this a lot, you know. Always be ready to give to anyone who asks of you a reason for the hope that lies within you, you know. If you're in biology class in your public high school, they start talking about evolution. Give a reason for the hope that lies within you. You know, stand up for the truth. Don't let them get away with all that evolutionary stuff. If you're in with the, the, the party crowd in high school, stand up for Christian morals. You know, always be ready to give to anyone who asks of you a reason for the hope that lies within you. But seldom did they go on and quote the rest of it. But do so with gentleness and reverence. And the question is, how do we treat each other in conversations about issues, political issues, about we, with which we seriously disagree? How do we treat each other with uh, kindness and gentleness and even a kind of reverential spirit? And I'm hoping that even though in Congress they may still be yelling at each other after January uh, 20. Uh, that many of us in the Christian community will be willing to sit back and just reflect on what we've been through for the last four years or the last year. Uh, you know, sometimes when uh, those of you who are deep friendships or marriages, uh, committed relationships, uh, will be familiar with this. There, there's, there, you have a fight and you really say mean things to each other. And you, 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 you walk out and you just, I don't know that we could ever talk to each other again after that. And then there comes a moment when one of the persons comes up to the other and very quietly says, can we talk? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry I said that. What I was really trying to say was, and that's the kind of conversation I think that we need after this election. Can we talk? Uh, here's what was going on with me. Here's the things that I was concerned about. And I think we owe that to the nation to have that, that kind of conversation as Christians. Because we're in difficult times. I think the social bond is, is, is fractured today. It's, uh, it's, it's in danger of being broken. The, the, the sense of shared citizenship of being committed to the common uh, Sociologists and others are, are very worried about what's happening in terms of the, the larger bond of citizenship uh, in this country. Uh, one of my favorite writers, spiritual writers, is a, a French woman who died, Simone Weil, the W-E-I-L. Uh, I've got a slide on this too. And uh, uh, she was a very devout Christian and a philosopher, a French philosopher. And uh, she wrote a nice book called The Need for Roots. And she talked there about how she struggles to try to figure out what it means to be French, you know, what, it, what it means to be a citizen of the French nation. And, and, and there's this wonderful distinction she made. She says, uh, I don't really like a patriotism founded upon pride and pomp and glory. What I want is a patriotism inspired by compassion, which requires loving one's country in these wonderful words. as something beautiful and precious, but which is in the first place imperfect and secondly, very frail and liable to suffer misfortune in which it is necessary to cherish and preserve. And I apply those words in, to, to, to my, my being an American, you know. I wanna, I wanna love my country in a way that's inspired by compassion. I wanna love my country as something beautiful and precious, but which is in the very first place, in, in the first place, imperfect. And secondly, a country that's very frail right now, very frail and liable to mis suffer misfortune and yet, which it is necessary to cherish and to preserve. Um, how do we do that? Uh, those of us who've been involved in interfaith dialogue, you know, Christians and Jews, Muslims and Jews, uh, Christians with Eastern religions and the like, um, 
there's somebody you can look this up on the internet, but uh, there, there's a wonderful document called the uh, the Dialogue Decalogue, <laughs> Ten Commandments for People Who Engage in Interfaith Dialogue, and uh, you can look at the at the specifics. There, there, I, I have found them very helpful. Um, but the but the underlying issue is that when you enter into dialogue with another person, not confrontation, not arguments, but dialogue. You have to enter into it with the spirit of being a learner. You, you really want to learn. And I think that's what the apostle Peter was talking about. Do so with gentleness and reverence, gentleness and respect that we want to learn from the other person. And I think when the election is over, uh, we might be able to get together with some of our friends with we have disagreed, we know they voted differently than we did, and, uh, and just try to learn what was going on with them. I, I think maybe, maybe one very good question that we can all ask after the election is, uh, how do you think Jesus feels about how we acted during this campaign? Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, maybe we even have to say to Jesus, hey, can we talk? Uh, I know I said such and such, but what I was really, really wanting to say what I was really trying to say was uh, not quite as harsh as it came across. And so to cultivate humility, you know, Psalm 139, at a certain point, the psalmist gets very arrogant. And he says, Lord, I hate your enemies with a perfect hatred. You know, Lord, you and I are on the same side. You can count on me. But then the wonderful thing is that he, the next verse, it's like he stops and says, uh, just a minute, Lord, search me and know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Yeah. And I think when the election is over, that might be a good verse for us to, to start off with. Lord, search us and know us and see if there's been any wicked way in us that we need to be aware of because you know what's really going in our hearts and i find that when we when we really want to learn from the other that uh, it, it's important to get beyond the surface stuff not to reduce the other person to who they voted for or even what they say about who they voted for um, i get a lot of my theology from hymns and, and some really good stuff from christmas carols and Last December, I was having, early December, I was having dinner with a Christian couple, and, and uh, she asked me, uh, what, have you ever watched The Bachelor? And I said, uh, not really, but I've read a lot about it. I think I, I know a lot about it without having had to watch it. She said, well, my two adult daughters, uh, every week they get together and watch The Bachelor, and they said to me, Mom, why don't you just join us? It's really fun to watch, you know. And she said, everything that I know about it, I think I hate it. And I don't want to get into big arguments with my, my kids about it, but uh, how would you handle that? And then I, you now they skip to the Christmas Carol. I had just heard a, uh, just, just heard, for, you know, a, a, a recording uh, of a Christmas Carol, the, the little town of Bethlehem, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in me tonight. I gave her that line. And I said, you know, uh, The Bachelor is in many ways a, a drama about hopes and fears. That beneath all the sexual innuendo and escapades and all the rest, uh, there are real human beings who, who don't want to be shamed, people who want to be loved, people who want to trust, people who want to find a sense of belonging. And I think it would be wonderful for you to say to your daughters, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to watch it with you next weekend. And, and here's something, uh, take this phrase, hopes and fears. Uh, can we talk about it afterward? What, what are the hopes and fears that we saw? And, and, and how do we bring good news to people on The Bachelor, you know, as, as Christians? And she said she was gonna try that, so I'm, I'm really glad. But we don't reduce the other person to just what we see on the surface. I was on NPR national program one time, and I was debating. Uh, some of you will know this is a technical term and not a put down, but a queer theory guy. 
from uh, an Eastern university, a gay rights activist, a LGBTQ uh, activist. And we had some tough conversations. And uh, I found him uh, an interesting conversation partner. Uh, he was, he and I really disagreed about stuff, about sexuality. And finally I said to him, uh, you know, I, I wish that, you know, we could do this on the radio and, and, and clarify things, but wouldn't it be important for folks like you and folks like me to get together and close the doors and just talk to each other? Yeah. And that I, that I could say to you, what is it about evangelicals like me that scare you so much, scares you so much? You know? and, 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 and you could ask me, what is it about what we LGBTQ people want to happen in our society that you find so threatening. And then we talk about it in terms of our hopes and our, our deeper fears. And thank God, he said, that would be a wonderful conversation to have. Well, at that point we quit and they went to uh, phone in. And the first person who called in said to the uh, host, why do you have this Mao guy on there? Are you gonna have a slave owner tomorrow defending slavery? And, and to his credit, uh, my, my dialogue partner said, just a minute, let me ask for that. And he said to the caller, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You know, we, we need to have gentle conversations about this. We need to stop yelling at each other. And he and I had some email exchanges after that. But you know, it's very important for us to, to really want to learn what's going on with the other person. And that means not reducing them simply to, even what they give the impression is their, their political identity. There's, there's something more going on there. And, uh, and, and I think, I, I, you know, when I've talked about civility, uh, people will sometimes say to me, yeah, but civility can't be the whole thing. I mean, there, sometimes you just really need to, to act, you really need to stand up. And you know, that's right, you know. Although I think that as Christians, we have erred more in the direction of incivility than we have in civility. And that we might even gain something by erring, erring in the other direction uh, for a little while. Uh, we might actually learn some, some new things. But uh, you know, I, I, I will say once somebody says to me, I say, you know, it, I hate Hitler. I, mean, I hate Nazi ideology. And if I were Dietrich Bonhoeffer and I got a chance to have a dialogue with Hitler, I wouldn't dialogue with him. I'd try to kill him. I mean, I, you just have to stop the guy, you know? Uh, civility is, is inappropriate with somebody like that. But it was interesting that uh, at, at a certain point, uh, a couple that's not uh, approached me and said, you know, our son is caught up in a skinhead group and he's really fascinated with Hitler and Mein Kampf and, and Nazi ideology. Would you be willing to talk to him? And I said, yeah, I would. You know, because this guy wasn't out trying to kill people. He just was enamored with these ideas. And when I talked to him, I was able to say, what is it that, that you find so attractive about this? Help me understand what it's like to really want these ideas to be true. And we actually had a pretty good conversation. And so even in a situation with a Nazi ideology in that kind of context, it's, it's not inappropriate uh, sometimes to just say, what are the hopes and fears that are going on in this person's life? And let me just say, we, we talked and, and Mike pitched this rightly as a question about kingdom identity. You know? And uh, I, I want to show you a slide. Uh, I, I actually went to about seven years ago, I went to North Korea uh, with uh, Don Chang, who was the owner and founder of uh, Forever 21. And he had some, at the time, some kind of business dealings with, uh, he had been approached by the North Korean government to uh, do something which he ended up refusing to do. But uh, he found out at a certain point that there were four villages in the northernmost part of North Korea that had uh, just been completely destroyed, devastated by landslides and floods. And the crops were ruined. 
and little children were dying on a daily basis. And so uh, he, he donated tons of food to those four villages uh, with two requirements. One is that every bag of flour, every drum of cooking oil had to have on it a blue cross, not the red cross, but a blue cross with the blue Korean letters for love your neighbor as yourself. And secondly, that he had to go to make sure that, uh, that, that the food actually got to those villages. And so we went, uh, driven by government officials, uh, uh, 10 hours of driving uh, north of, in North Korea. But over the weekend when we were there, uh, we actually went to a church in North Korea, in Pyongyang. Uh, we were told that it was one of four legally approved Christian services and there were German and Canadian diplomats there that day. And they told us they went every week. So it wasn't just a show that they were putting on for us. And they had this choir. Uh, uh, it was an old Presbyterian church and uh, built by missionaries. And they had looked like Presbyterian choir robes uh, too. And so this, I took this picture. And, and that woman uh, the, the, in the front row, the second from the right, that young woman, uh, at a certain point, they sang in Korean, what a friend we have in Jesus. And as she was singing the verse that uh, in English is, are we weak and heavy laden, burdened with a load of care? Jesus knows our every weakness, take it to the Lord in prayer. Tears were just streaming down her face. And all of a sudden it hit me, I'm, I'm not here as a tourist. This is a family visit. That's my sister in Christ. And and honestly, that, I, 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 I pray for her. I, 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 whenever I hear in a debate something about policy about North Korea, and, and I'm not saying that I, I think it's a horrible government, all the rest, and, and I don't have a lot of prescriptions to make about it. But when I hear somebody mention North Korea, I, I think I have family there. You know, I have a sister in Christ. And it's a very biblical idea that Jesus Christ has made us citizens of a larger kingdom drawn from every tribe and tongue and nation of the earth through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so what I have in common with that sister is that she is saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that gives us something deep that we share in common. And my, my shared citizenship with her is greater than my citizenship in the United States or her citizenship in North Korea. That doesn't mean it's irrelevant and I care about my country and she certainly grieves over things happening in her country. But it's so important for us to begin with the body of Christ, recognizing that, that when we gather on Sunday mornings in church or we're gathered uh, through Zoom services, that we're joining people around the world from every tribe and tongue and nation who are citizens of the same kingdom uh, that we are very much a part of. And so remembering that citizenship in the kingdom, that Jesus Christ, and, and, and Mike, when he prayed about this, Jesus Christ is the ruler over all things. Yeah. He is the supreme king of the universe. And our ultimate loyalties are not to a nation, our ultimate loyalties are not to a nation or to a race or to a tribe or to a people, but to the worldwide body of Jesus Christ. So to recognize that, and secondly, to commit ourselves to some of the basics, not in an ideological way, and we can disagree in terms of philosophies of government, but racism is a theological heresy. For us, the white people or Asian people or black people to think that they are the superior race is in direct contradiction to the fact that God has created every child of God in the image of the God and Father of Jesus Christ. And that we have no business uh, thinking in racist terms. And we've got a lot to learn about that. Uh, and, you know, we can get hung up on systemic racism and all that, but the fact is that there are people of other races, I say this as a white person, 
who have been treated in horrible ways simply because of the color of their skin, because of their, their racial uh, makeup. And, uh, and the same thing with strangers in the land, vulnerable people, or interfaith things. You know. I, I debated a Muslim theologian, a woman Muslim theologian on a university campus. And uh, we were both uh, invited to this campus. And so I, we were in a, they, they, they had a car service that took us back to the airport. She and I had big arguments. Uh, uh, she was very good, but we, we argued. But when we were in the car, I asked her about her family. And uh, she was in her 30s and she had three kids. And she, with tears in her eyes, says, every day, when my kids go off to school, I pray that they will not be bullied in the playground again. And I saw something of her humanity, something of her, her humanness. This is a mother who cares about her children. These are little kids who are frightened of my kind of Christians because of the way that they're often treated in playgrounds or, or coming home from school. And it's so important for us to personalize these issues and to get beyond the surfaces and then to pray intelligently, uh, to pray for people, pray for that, that woman in, in North Korea, pray for the Muslim woman, and then see what God is calling us to do and to be out of those kinds of prayers. And then finally, to live in hope. You know? uh, Sarah Pulliam Bailey is one of the reporters for the Washington Post. And she told me uh, a year ago that she, she interviewed a lot of evangelical Christians about who were going to vote for Donald Trump. And she said, uh, you know, it was interesting. People say that they've been taken up with a kind of right-wing ideology, but they actually had biblical reasons for what they were going to vote for. And she said, uh, some of them compared Donald Trump to King David. And just as God could use King David in despite of some behavioral uh, waywardness, uh, sins that he committed, and others uh, compared him to the pagan ruler in the Old Testament, Cyrus, who actually did some good things for the Jewish people. And God, uh, God refers to Cyrus, is quoted as referring to Cyrus as my servant, Cyrus, a pagan ruler. And, and I think in, in many ways, that's a good sign uh, that, that I think Christian people on both sides of the aisle are willing to think, what does the Bible have to say about this? And this is a good time to get into the word of God and really explore what all that means. And with that, I throw it open to my fellow panelists. Well, thank you, Dr. Mao, for sharing and uh, just now your video is coming back. I want to let you know that uh, we heard everything you said. There were a number of times where your uh, screen might have frozen, but uh, we were able to listen to everything that you shared. So thank you for your time and for sharing that with us. Um, I'm going to open it up and introduce uh, some of our panelists this evening. Um, first, we have Elizabeth Adedokun, who is our deacon moderator for 2021, and she's a uh, professional in the homeless services uh, in Los Angeles. And we have Norley Goodrow, she's an elder at Bel Air Church, a lay leader in discipleship, and a human resource extraordinaire, a specialist in every way. Uh, we have Dana Clausen, who is a deacon here and um, head of a legal engineering firm. So she's a lawyer, and we have Eric Smith, who is a volunteer in our kids' ministry. Uh, he is a deacon and he's a television producer. Now, I chose uh, all these panelists not be, uh, because of their political expertise or even their background, but more because I trust that um, these panelists can model for us, or at least try to model, what does it look like for us to engage in courageous conversation, to really seek kingdom connection over political partisanship, and it's uh, something that we, as a panel, myself included, uh, have not got this dialed. We are practicing. Uh, we don't have everything figured out, but we are choosing to lean in, to, to connect with one another. And we're choosing to follow some of the principles that Jared Bias shared with us at the last forum. So again, uh, just wanted to remind everyone of that. Uh, so thank you panelists for being 
a part of this conversation tonight. And I wanted to uh, ask Dr. Mao the first question. Um, Dr. Mao, there, there are people who have tuned in tonight and there are some people that might have tuned out tonight uh, based on a political statement that you've recently made. And uh, do you feel like you have broken ranks from evangelicalism? <laughs> no, I think uh, I, I think some some people that I disagree with have broken the ranks with evangelicalism. But no, I'm I I I think there's a real meaning to the term evangelical, and I don't want to lose it. Uh, we're evangelical, and think some of the things that I said, you know, we're saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, what He did on the cross for us. Uh, we believe in the, the, uh, the supreme authority of the Word of God. Uh, we believe that once we understand what the Bible is really telling us about God's will for human beings, that we need to stick to it at all costs. You know, And so the biblical authority, the, the saving work of Jesus Christ, the personal power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the importance of being a part of a church where we hear the gospel proclaimed and we gather around the table and fellowship with our Lord and we support the global work of the church, the missionary movement. All of these things, I think, are, are at the heart of what evangelical gospel identity is all about. Um, I don't think there's one way for evangelicals to vote. I don't think there's one party that evangelicals should support. And I know that some people will think that uh, I've given up because I'm supporting what is in their view, the wrong party. But uh, I, I do think that this is a good occasion and maybe when the election is over, uh, we can talk about what, what are those identities mean to us when we say that we're, we're pro-life when we say that we're traditional in our understanding of sexuality, when we say we're, we believe in religious freedom, you know, uh, these kinds of things that for all of us as evangelicals, I, I met with the, I'll tell you, I mean, I met with the Biden people a couple times now, and, and I said, you know, uh, I, I, we want to argue with you folks. We want to argue with Mr. Biden. And if he gets elected, I hope that you will continue to, because we don't want to just come to the White House and lay hands of blessing on us so that to get a photo op out of it. We want to argue. And the, and the big issues that I want to argue about are life, what it means to be pro-life, what it means to support religious freedom, and what it means to care about uh, a lot of the issues that evangelicals care about in terms of uh, uh, sexuality. And, and the like. And uh, we want to be heard on this and not just heard like, oh, it's just wonderful that you shared your perspective. But we want to have an impact on policy on this. And, and, and let me just say this. Deciding who to vote for, one big question is, who can you lobby you know, if they get elected? And that's an important question for some of us. You know? uh, and I'm, I've been really working hard <laughs> to, to, to uh, see to it that both parties are willing to talk to people of evangelical convictions about the things that we evangelical Christians care about deeply. And uh, so anyway, yeah. Well, I haven't really said to the panelists who's gonna have the first shot of the question, but uh, Nora Lee, I want you to have a moment. Uh, as you hear from Rich Mao, are there uh, questions that are stirring within you? Uh, do you want to seek better understanding, help me understand uh, those kinds of questions? What's, what's resonating with you? Well, I have a whole lot of questions. But uh, one of the questions I have is, uh, well, first I want to preface this by saying it's what's noticeably absent is discourse. And there's a lot of professing as opposed to discussing going on. And I am wondering how it is that the church can equip us as people of God, as Christians, to redirect those kinds of, um, those kinds of incidents where they're, because it's, it, 
it, it just seems that we don't have discussions. So how do we how do we reverse that? How do we change course as a people? How does the church equip us to do that? And I think that because if we, you know, even if we listen to the if the media, if we read the newspapers, if we, you know what I mean, you you just don't have any discussion. We just had professing, you know, one way or another. And so how do we get into meaningful conversations? right now with people because there's a lot going on this is a time in our lives i mean i've been around since god was a boy and i've never seen a time like this in my life and uh you know there are issues that are really important that i would like to discuss um coming from there and i'm sure i'm not alone coming from immigrant families who came from countries that were uh communist or marxist or you know, they came to America because, you know, of what America stands for. And now we can't discuss some of the things that are kind of red flags to us. And I just want to know what, what we can do, what you believe the church can do, what's the appropriate place for the church to enter into this without being political. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's a, that's such an important question. And, and I want to see, um, just for starters, a, a kind of a simple point. So, some of it means learning how to talk <laughs> uh, on on these issues. Unfortunately, it looks like we might have lost Dr. Mao. His uh, bandwidth <laughs> was low. Uh, hopefully, he'll circle back, and uh, maybe those that are on the back end of this could reach out to him. But. Uh, <laughs> You know, I think that's a that's a good question, and here we are with a panel, and I open it up to the panel. How, as Nora Lee presents this question, yes, she pre presented it to Dr. Mao, but uh, as you hear that question, what are some of the things that are you know that do you have ideas? Do you have suggestions? What does that look like for us? Yeah, I, my first thought was uh, something that Jared had mentioned last week was just about the desire to listen and hear somebody else, and I think uh, as much as we can encourage that from our end, it can inspire that from the other side, but it's, it's got to start with us having the humility he talked about. I think so much uh, in political discussions, and I'm incredibly guilty of this, it, there's kind of a rush to kind of prove your position. And sometimes you don't even really fully pay attention to what the other person is saying, because it's settled in your mind. You know, you've, you've already made your decision and now you're just trying to convince somebody of it. Um, but that idea of curiosity and asking the questions to really make sure you understand where somebody else is coming from I think that becomes reciprocal pretty quickly when, you, when you're genuine about it. I actually really agree with that. And to build on, on your point, um, Eric, with what Jared said last um, session, the straw man argument of the, I find myself guilty of this over and over again, of coming to somebody who disagrees with me and thinking, well, this is what you believe. And then they come at me with, this is what you believe. And it's actually not true but there's an assumption and a bias in, in, I think, everyone's mind as to what somebody of the other side thinks and believes. And um, like, I know personally, I need to get better at being curious and learning as opposed to convincing. <laughs> and um, I, I agree with everything that you've said. And as someone who has lived in, um, different countries on three different um, continents, I have learned that we have more in common than we have differences. Um, so I, I think in the current climate, um, we, we fall into the temptation of, um, of wanting to treat somebody else as different, right? Um, so we, 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 we tend to sometimes without really realizing it, want to, um, to, to, to prepare an argument as to why, you know, we think that this person's um, idea or opinion is, is not the right one, right? So I, I, I've learned over the years um, to approach every conversation with, the spirit of wanting to learn. Because even if somebody's opinion or values are different than mine, 
I learned something new from every conversation, even in my own family. I learned something new from my parents, from my siblings, and from my coworkers. But I would never learn if I don't listen. So I think that is um, really the foundation of how we can get things to turn around, to have that mindset of, um, of really listening. It doesn't mean we're going to agree, but we can listen to understand. Yeah, shall I? I'm sorry, I don't know what happened, but I, I just. <laughs> with, with, with both of these, both of these good, good comments and the questions implicit in the comments. Um, you know, one of the simple things is in in discourse and in, in what Elizabeth just referred to in listening, is to make sure that you you keep the conversation going because there, if 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 it looks like you're trying to win the argument. Or, or if you're using confrontation, what do you mean by that? You know, it puts the person on the defensive. Uh, but suppose you say, help me to understand that a little better. Uh, is this the way you'd put it? You know? Because the goal of dialogue, of real conversation is to understand what the other person believes in the way that they would agree <laughs> they see things. And how can the church do that? Well, I think, uh, I, I, I really don't think uh, political sermons are, are very important in, in this. I think it's book clubs, it's discussion groups, it's an event, it's events like this. And uh, where, where the church needs to say it's okay to disagree. It's, yeah. it's you know, and, and that's important, but that it's important that we try to understand each other and especially how our faith motivates our, our views. Because I, I know, and, and I get really upset when, when some of my left-wing friends uh, you know, s seem to deny this, but I, I know people who are going to vote for a candidate that I will not vote for, who are sincerely Christian in their motivation. And I talked to one today on the phone, and, and I said, yeah, we're gonna, you and I are going to vote differently, but I really respect the the reasons that you have for for doing this, and I think that's so important. And then also to find ways in which we can personalize these issues. Uh, I well, anyway, there there are a lot of a lot of ways to do that, but we need stories. I I think the story of the just the simple little story of the woman in the choir in North Korea, uh, for me, uh, just to to think about why she was weeping that day and you know, what it was like for yeah. her to love Jesus and to weep when she sings about Jesus, understanding her troubles uh, is such an important part of my motivation as a, as a Christian and trying to understand people who are very different from myself. Yeah. You know, you mentioned in your book that passionate intensity is not always inappropriate. And um, I, I, I'm saying that on the heels of being civil, being kind, being uh, gentle, and realizing that there are times when uh, something, that passion is really important in, in a conversation. Yeah. And um, I mean, even in the scripture, it talks about, you were talking about what is evil and it, the scriptures say, hate what is evil and hold fast to what is fine and sort of, it's sort of a paradox, you know, how do you hold those two in tension? You know what I mean? Yeah. Especially now for me, uh, that's a, that's a question I have. Yeah. And you know, it's uh, GK Chesterton, the great Catholic writer uh, once said, it's a terrible thing to worship false gods, but it's <laughs> also a terrible thing to set up false demons. You know? Yeah. <laughs> And, and I, I do think that passion is good, but when it takes the form of the demonization of the other, uh, and again, there are demons, you know, <laughs> and there are wicked people, but we have to be careful about, uh, yeah. uh, Lord, I hate your enemies with a perfect hatred. Well, you know, it's, uh, I'm not sure I understand myself all that well <laughs> at times uh, for me to, to be very clear about what's going on in the heart and the mind of another person. Yeah. Is 
to open it up if there's other questions as you're considering this is what you you're mulling around right now are there things that are coming to mind that you'd like to pose i'm not even sure how to ask this um so if this comes out clunky i apologize but <clears throat> Something I've noticed in, in political discussions with fellow Christians is kind of where the demarcation is between Christianity and politics and what is the role of politics to, to um, I'm gonna say enforce, which is the wrong word, but enforce our version of, of Christianity. How much should we be relying on the government to, to embody what we believe morally? Anything from something as simple as like you know, school prayer, should that be mandated or protected? Or social programs, how large should they be to you know, protect the, the poor or something? Um, how do you keep, how do you keep um, the discussion focused on the Christian principles even if that means at the expense of the politics, you know, how do you, how do you not fall into the trap of marrying those things into a single identity to where, because I, you know, I know both sides uh, repeatedly kind of claim the, the Christian superiority, the moral high ground based on what they, they see as important. Um, how do you, how do you keep that separate and clean and know that your Christianity is, is distinct from your politics? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I mean, the, you, Eric, the, you, you've asked the question so well, and, and there really are a number of layers there. I mean, I, you know, uh, I, I was working with the Jewish community and I, I had a, a rabbi, a younger rabbi who, who, who came to my office and spent an hour and a half, we were dealing with some second amendment issues of the project. And he wrote me a note a week later and said, I wanna thank you for <clears throat> allowing me to spend an hour and a half with an evangelical Christian and feel safe. And he said, I want to explain that. He said, I was raised in a little town in Minnesota. I was the only Jewish kid in town. And he said, in school every day in those days, the, the teacher was in the public school was usually a Lutheran. And she always began the day by saying, boys and girls, let's say the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. And he said, my rabbi, we went to a synagogue one town over, uh, told me that uh, I wasn't, as a Jew, I wasn't to pray that, the Lord's Prayer. And he said, uh, kids would, would bully me on the playground. Uh, they, would, they would try to beat me up on the way home from school, and they would call me a Christ killer. You know? And he said, when I was told I gotta, I've got to go on a campus of an evangelical seminary and spend an hour and a half with the president, he said, when I walked onto your campus, I broke out in a cold sweat. You know? And he said, I just want to thank you that I felt safe. You know? Now, there is a, there is a, a prayer and school issue right there. You know? And uh, we tend to get into an argument with secularists on this. But why not have discussions with Muslims about it? Why not have discussions with Jews about it? You know? And, uh, and, and try to find out what it is that's non-negotiable for us on that and, and, and how we could maybe respect the rights of believing kids in a classroom of different, different faiths and at the same time respect the rights of the atheist kid in class who might also get beat up on the way home from school for, for refusing to pray, you know. And I think in part, Eric, uh, one of the big issues today is we want the right, Fuller Seminary is just had a legal case over sexuality, you know. We want the right to configure the patterns of our community in accordance with our deepest convictions, you know. And that's a right of a community that has convictions. But at the same time, I want to say, uh, that means that I want to argue for the rights of Muslim school. I want to, I want to argue for the rights of Hasidic uh, Jews and the way they go about uh, something. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna argue for the rights of, of Jews to dress the way that their religion dictates, just as well to argue uh, for the right of Amish and the right of Muslim to dress in the way that they, you know. And so uh, what we want for ourselves, uh, we, we shouldn't sound selfish about that, but we should be, be advocating on the part of, of atheists, the, the one atheist family in the town of Minnesota might also be somebody we would, we would stand up for. You know? And so I think once we take that approach, 
we're not saying how much can we get out of this government to support my beliefs or my convictions, but uh, how can we promote a just society in which different worldviews, different perspectives, and you know what, that's good for us because we're often looked at as pushy people who want to, you know, want to push our own stuff. And maybe we'll get a better chance to witness to, the, to what Jesus means to us by showing an interest in what other people really, really believe. So that's what I'm kind of interested in working on these days is a, a pluralism that respects the right of diversity in our society and not just getting into a Christians versus seculars kind of thing. One of the things that um, that we learned when I was in law school in constitutional law was, I think this is sort of a, a well-known fact that the separation of church and state as the founders intended it was for the protection of the church from the corruption of politics. And so I, I feel like that's one of the things that is, is almost getting lost in the dialogues we're having now about if you're a Christian, you have to vote this way or you have to vote that way is the fact that even by saying that we are at risk of, of corrupting the church somehow. And, and I find that kind of scary and I don't know how to address it, but I feel like that's something that isn't being discussed right now. Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, I, I find the discussions uh, when, when it's limited to church and state to be kind of barren <laughs> discussion, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm much more interested of in the role of religion in public life. You know, I mean, I'm not defending my church. If I write a, a, a letter to the editor of the LA Times on immigration policy and mention the fact that as a Christian, I'm very concerned. I think God is very concerned about little kids in cages on borders, you know. And, and that's not my church violating the boundaries of church, that's, that's public life. And public life is a lot bigger than politics, you know? The right to life movement may, may be working on uh, promoting adoption uh, and foster families, kind of, kind of medical care available to, to women who can't afford it. Uh, and so they're, uh, you know, praying at a ball game. I mean, you, you, you score the touchdown and just to bow your head. That's not a violation of church and state. That's just a young tight end uh, recognizing that he's playing in a stadium that also is under the rule of God. You know? And uh, that's a big issue. But, you know, I think there are a lot of ways in which we can express our faith openly in public life. Uh, without getting into church-state relationships. And, uh, and this is why I think, you know, it's very good for there to be a Christian medical society, a Christian legal society, fellowship of Christian athletes, a lot of different groups that are public, but there really aren't church-state issues, you know. Yeah. So as we talk about this, you know, this is coming from the forum. One of the questions I wanted to ask is, in line of what we're talking about, you know, public life versus political life and the church's role or sh should the church stay out of it? You know, uh, I hear at times the church should stay out of politics or social issues. You know, you can hear things like just preach the gospel um, and stay out of politics. And so how would you respond to something like that? Like, what is the church's role? in, in is there a role of the church in politics or is it is politics being confused with public life? And so when you talk about public life, it sounds like politics. How, what would you say to the church? Yeah. Well, I, 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 again, church is a lot bigger than uh, the, the sermon on Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, it's one thing. I, I think that people leading in prayer, public prayer, can pray for vulnerable families on the borders, uh, can pray for uh, brothers and sisters from a local African-American church who are right now really struggling with some, some issues that some of us don't understand. I mean, so the way we pray, what we pray for, you know, uh, I, I have used that story of, and that slide about the North Korean woman in, in sermons and in seminars at churches, like I did tonight, 
I've never heard anybody accuse me of playing politics like that. You know? uh, and, and, but but it, it shapes my attitude toward my own citizenship <laughs> and her citizenship, you know? So I think there are, there are a lot of different ways of, of doing it beyond should the church speak out on politics. Uh, so a pastor in rural Iowa uh, said to me, uh, you know, it's an all white farming town and the nearest black community is 70 miles away in a big city. And uh, how do I get my people even to think about race relations? You know? And I said, you know, start with your youth group. Well, first of all, find out about a black church in the big city and get to know their pastor and say, uh, could we send a couple of our young people with cell phones to just tape some people in your congregation asking for prayer for something that's going to happen to them in the next week or two? You know, a mother who's concerned about her son uh, hanging around with people in gangs or she's, good, she's got surgery coming up or something. And asking this white congregation... And, and, and young people would, would love to use it. They know the technology. They can do something like that. And you play it in the local service. And then you ask their young people to come and tape some things, you know, that, that your people. So that you, you, you learn to, we have the technology and we have the, ex, the technical expertise with 16 year old kids that, that we, could, we could actually start praying for people in the inner city. And know that they're praying for us. And, and and now, does that have political implications? Of course it does. You know? That if 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 somebody says, I, I don't believe Black Lives Matter, uh, if if you've been doing that for, for a year, you say, Well, I'm not necessarily endorsing the the official policies of the group called Black Lives Matter, but Black Lives of, of the Church. <laughs> in that city really do matter to God and they matter to, matter to God because they matter to me, you know? So I think there are ways in which we can, we can try to raise consciousness about things. And some of it has to do with the prayer life of the church, the kind of books that we choose for study groups. Uh, there, there was a, a friend, one of my, my doctoral students wrote a wonderful uh, dissertation on, on evangelicals in relation to Islam. And he talked about being hospitable, hospitable to, to, to Muslims. And he talked about a church in Amsterdam, or in Rotterdam, uh, that was very conservative Calvinist church. And they had the imam come in, and that didn't go very well or anything. But there were six Dutch reformed women in that church who had a knitting group that met one morning a week. And they decided to invite Muslim women to knit with them. You know? and, and, and these Muslim women accepted the invitation. And they didn't even talk for the first couple of weeks. And then one of the Christian women said to the Muslim, what are you knitting? They said, oh, it's a scarf for my grandson. How old is he? You know? And how's he doing in school? And they actually began praying for You know, I'm going to pray for him, you know. And after a while, they even talked, well, what does prayer mean to you? And they actually got a discussion going because they were knitting together. And I know another congregation in the Midwest that had Syrian refugees, Muslim refugees in the town. And there was a, actually a, a, a Syrian restaurant in a nearby city. And, and some of the Christian people went to some Syrian refugee families and said, if, if we paid for the meal, would you teach us how to order food in that restaurant? Yeah. And they actually had a meal together. And, and, and they kept up the relationship uh, out of that. Well, you know, those are creative things that we can do that get beyond. But that has implications then when somebody starts talking about how bad Muslim people are in terms of some kind of legislation or some kind of public policy. And at the very least, you want to say, oh, it's just a, we have dinner with these folks. You know? They teach us stuff about food. And, and I think we, we need to begin on that level of uh, there are creative things and people far more creative than, and I think young people are too. 
real resources of this. Yeah. Is there um, a chance to ask one more question, Pastor Mike? Do we have time? Dr. Mal, what do you think? Oh, I'm all for it. I want to hear all it. All right, lovely. Um, okay, so one of my favorite sayings, especially when I'm going through difficult times, is this too shall pass. Yeah. And I think, um, I, I've been saying that a lot lately. And I believe that when we're going through challenging times, um, we're going through those times to get to something better than what we just went through. Do you feel, Dr. Mao, that um, that is going to be the situation here too, that we're going to be okay, we're going to get past this? And things are going to be better for what he, because of what we've just gone through or what we're going through now. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. You know, I'm I'm with you on that. I I I don't want to say I'm an optimist, but I'm hopeful, and it's a Christian hope. And I do believe that um, after the election, I think a lot of people are are going to be tired. And they say, we don't want to go through this again. And there may be a, more of an openness to get to know each other and to talk about these things. Uh, and, and, and I think good things have, have happened. Right? I mean, I've been very critical of Joel Osteen. I, I don't like his style. I don't like his theology and everything. But during the um, marches, uh, inspired by the Black Lives Matter and, and some of the violence that had happened. There was a thing in Houston where Joel Osteen was marching for racial justice. And the, and the reporter stopped him and said, uh, and, and, and Joel Osteen took his mask off and it really was him. And they said, why are you doing this? And he said, because I have black Christian friends in my congregation that convinced me, and he said, something's been happening in my soul. And I just feel like I had to walk alongside of my black brothers and sisters in Christ to stand up for racial justice. Now I say, thank God. Now when he said, something's been happening in my soul, I think that there may be good things happening in our souls, maybe even in the souls of non-Christian people. Uh, after the the, the extreme polarization, the, the, the draining polarization of, of this campaign. I, I, I think that we may see in January, February, March, uh, people, people reflecting on what it was. I'm just saying, can we talk? I, I know I said a lot of things. My kind of people said a lot of things, but you know, what we're really trying to say is and, and maybe you can start listening to it. So Elizabeth, as, a, as, a, as, a, as one who believes that God is in control and that if we're willing to be a learning people, I think that something good can come out of that. So I'm, I'm hopeful. But it's going to be new. You know? We're not going to be able to go back simply to the way it was. But that's okay. We need to walk through it, embrace it, and then go beyond it. Well, with that, I thank you, Dr. Mao, for taking the time with us this evening. Thanks for sharing with us your wisdom and for being willing to guide and direct us entering into this conversation with us, uh, sharing courageously yourself and uh, panelists. Thank you so much for your presence here tonight and for your thoughtful questions. Uh, one thing we didn't talk over each other, I think that's a big win. Um, no one, you know, I didn't see anyone throwing anything at each other. That's another big win. Also a benefit of being on Zoom, uh, but well done everybody. Uh, I think this is a, a great first start and well, actually it's a second start into this Friday night forum. And we are, we're hoping to create a safe enough environment where we can have courageous conversations around challenging topics. And you know, just kind of recapping a little bit of what I heard tonight and uh, is that our ultimate loyalty is kingdom citizenship. And that we need to commit ourselves to engaging 
in culture well beyond the election. This doesn't stop with a vote, but it continues well into 2021. We need to pray intelligently. And we need to really consider what our prayers are all about. And we need to be people of hope who live in hope. And so um, I'm also struck by this hopes and fears. I think that we can get really passionate about things uh, and, and angry about things um, and underlying that could be a fear or a hope that might be threatened. And I think part of what we can do in, in the dialogues coming up uh, in the weeks and months and years to head, head is to engage with vulnerability that says, this is what I'm hoping for, or this is what I'm afraid of. And this is what, um, and, and share myself with you. And I hope that you would share yourself with me so I can help to better understand who you are and what you're concerned about. And so with that, I wanna, um, you know, as we explore hopes and fears, as we learn to love our neighbor in, in unique and new ways, uh, whether that's knitting, uh, we are gonna have another Friday night forum uh, coming up on Friday, December 4th. So uh, yes, you can have your November off. We're gonna start again uh, Friday, December 4th. And it's title uh, right now, rough title, okay? Uh, but right now the rough title is Happy Holidays and it's loving your neighbor of another faith this holiday season. And so we're gonna try to have that uh, conversation uh, across faiths and just to learn about one another and what their hopes are and what our, our fears are and how we can actually love each other in this coming um, month uh, and, and year ahead. So that's our hope. Dr. Mao, I wanna thank you for being with us tonight. Um, the, the rest of you, if you want to stick around, we're going to try to go into breakout groups. And what we're going to do in those breakout groups is continue the conversation. And hopefully we would continue the conversation in a kingdom connection kind of way where we're seeking to understand one another. We might ask one another, what are your hopes? What are your fears? How can I be praying for you? Uh, and it might, you might be praying for someone that has a totally different political affiliation than you do, but how can you do that in this next month ahead? So we're going to give that space. If you don't want to participate in, in that, uh, as soon as we end tonight, this would be a good time for you to leave and uh, you don't have to stick around. But if you want to, uh, we'll keep the forum open for a little bit longer. Again, Dr. Mao, thank you so much. We're so grateful for you. God bless you. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, everybody. Good to be with you tonight.